What's up, my peoples? Welcome to Urban Reform Podcast. I'm your host, Ricky Rodan. And today, I want to get into the transcendental argument for the existence of God, also known as TAG, T-A-G. It's a short acronym for it, so we're going to have to keep typing out transcendental argument for the existence of God <laughs> every time we address it. Okay, and again, I wanted to reiterate that um, this series is not nothing deeply philosophical and technical. I want it to be made simple. I want everyone to understand it. So I will be explaining it very, um, hopefully, easily and clear for you guys. It's very simple. Okay, it's when we get into the objections of, of tag that we get technical things like that. The uh, the uh, critiques that people come against the transcendental argument and presupposition apologetics is where actually we get into the deep weeds of everything, which we also will be getting into. But for this episode. Just want to explain briefly what TAG is. And I got into some of it already in the other episodes in uh, part one and part two. And also the podcast, the episode, uh, Why I'm a Christian. I got into uh, some of that at the end. But today I want to just to address the definition now, as I said in the other, uh, my last podcast on what transcendental is, um, a, a, tr- a transcendental argument pretty much is wanting to know, wanting to find out what are the underlying presuppositions of, okay, a, of facts, of knowledge. Okay, of truth. What are the preconditions necessary to even have presuppositions, to have a belief system? Okay, everyone has beliefs. Everyone comes to the table with presuppositions, with beliefs that you already hold to. Nobody comes to the table to the table neutral. Okay, nobody comes with no beliefs whatsoever. That's ridiculous and impossible. Okay, but transcendentals want to know what is the what is the uh, precondition for having that belief? Okay, what are the preconditions in this case? Okay, what are the preconditions that lead to knowledge, to truth? Okay, when we use logic, the laws of logic, um, the law of non-contradiction, our reasoning, our senses, and like I said before, when using evidences, when we're determining and, and looking at evidences and proofs. But what are the preconditions that make proofs and evidences, knowledge came, claims and truth possible in the first place? Okay, and that argument is this, okay, for the for the existence of God and not just any God. Okay, I like to modify a little bit and that that it's a transcendental argument for the existence of the God of Scripture. Okay, the triune God, the only God that exists. I think that's what confuses people a lot. They 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 hear the word God and right away they think of generality. They think of a some general God, so they ask the question, "But well, why can't I be any God? Okay, why the Christian God?" And we'll get into that objection and question a little bit later, or even another episode depends on how much time I get left. <laughs> so, the transcendental argument for the existence of God, the Christian God, the God of the Bible, is this: that the proof. That the Christian God exists is that without him, you can't prove anything 
at all. Okay? Let me say that again. The proof that God exists, the Christian God exists, is that without him, you can't prove anything. Okay, so what does that mean? Basically, it's saying that God, the God of Scripture, and for for sake of uh, not being repetitive, okay, when I say God, I am speaking of the only true living God, and that's the God of the Bible, okay? Because I don't want to keep saying the God of the Bible, the God of the Bible. I, when I say God, I mean the Christian God, because according to my Christian worldview, there is no other gods. So I won't be referring to any God anyway. So no general God, so general gods don't exist, okay? So with that established, I'll continue. Um, so basically what that is saying is that God is the ultimate precondition for the existence of knowledge. God is the ultimate precondition for the laws of logic, for the uniformity of nature, meaning you know, nature being uh, driven by laws. Nature itself, okay, obeys laws. Logic obeys laws. Reasoning obeys laws. Knowledge obeys laws. So what we're saying is that God is that ultimate precondition for these laws. Okay? And there is no other worldview that can account or justify these preconditions of intelligibility. That's what we call them, preconditions of intelligibility, which I've explained is the laws of logic, the reliability of your senses, of your memory, of your reasoning process, the uniformity of nature, things like that, that make reality possible. Okay, that's how we live in reality is by using these preconditions of intelligibility. It's what makes anything intelligible in the first place. Okay, and so the only way to account for these things, to justify how we know these things exist and how we know that it's reliable and working is by the God who has revealed himself in scripture, the Bible. Without his revelation, without God revealing himself to us and the principles of how we are to live in a, a physical world, you cannot justify anything. You cannot justify reasoning. You can't justify knowledge. Okay? Because the scriptures tell us that in Christ, okay, in Christ are hidden the uh, keys of wisdom and knowledge. Okay? And that the beginning of knowledge is the fear of the Lord. Okay, I didn't not quoting those verses verbatim, just summarizing. Okay, that the beginning of knowledge is the fear of God, the fear of the Lord, believing in Him, having that ultimate authority and standard by which we are able to make knowledge claims, to use our reasoning, to use our senses. Okay. There's no way around that. This irrefutable. Okay, because it is only this God that can justify knowledge and truth. Now, why is that? Probably wonder why, how come? Okay, well, it is only in the Christian God that is eternal. 
It's only in the Christian God that is omniscient, meaning he has all knowledge. He knows all things and he knows all things with absolute certainty. He is infinite in his wisdom. Okay. He doesn't change. Okay. He is immutable. He doesn't change. Okay. He is triune. He is three persons in one God. That shows a uniformity. Okay. And in diversity. That God is diverse in three persons, but unified as one. And that's how he created nature. And that's why the triune God accounts for the uniformity of nature. Because nature is diverse, but is united as one. Nature follows the laws of God that he has placed for nature. Okay, so we see that diversity in the universe. Okay, it's diverse, multi, you know, it's very large and diverse, but it is also one. There is no other God that can account for that. Only the triune God of Scripture can account for the uniformity of nature. Okay. And, and these characteristics, these attributes of God in Scripture, okay, it is unique to the Christian God, okay? In Islam, they just say God is one. There's no diversity and unity. So, Islam can't account for the uniformity of nature, Islam can't account for the preconditions of intelligibility. Why is that? Because even in Islam, okay, even in Islam, it teaches that man is not created in the image of God. That God is so transcendent and he does not condescend to his creation. Okay. Yeah, he works within his creation but they don't believe that they don't believe in in the condensation of of god meaning that god comes down and interacts with man okay because we're created in his image the, the islam will look at that as blasphemy to claim that humans are made in the image of god even in judaism look look what happened why they killed jesus because he was saying things. When he was saying, I and the Father are one, he was claiming to be in the image of the Father. They looked at that as blasphemic to make such a claim. Okay? That he's a son of God. So these little details matter. And that's what confuses people a lot. Because they're, they're not looking at the theology of the situation. They're not taking into account the attributes of God that the Bible talks about. God is all knowing. He knows all things and he shares his knowledge with man. And in doing that, we can know things. He's given us the gifts, the tools of rationality, which again are the preconditions of intelligibility. You're going to hear that, that term a lot. And I'm not afraid to keep using it. Oh, we, you know, keep using that term precondition. Yeah, but that, that's part of the argument. Okay, that's part of the argument. As long as we explain what these terms mean, we should not fear and using these terms because people don't like it or somebody complains about the terms. Learn the terms. If you're going to engage presuppositionalists, learn their lingo, learn their language. And if presuppositionalists are going to engage non-believers and other systems of apologetics, we got to learn their lingo. Same thing. Okay, so we have to understand these terms. So, again, only God can account for the laws of logic, for our reasoning, 
or the validity of our senses, our memory, uniformity of nature, and these things that make rationality possible to live in the real world. Like I said last time, it is a matter of world views. In the Christian worldview, it is complete and it is rational. Okay. It is a complete rational worldview that justifies and accounts for how we have knowledge and how do we know what we know. That we call revelational epistemology. Epistemology meaning the theory of knowledge. Revelational meaning God's revelation, his word. So how do we know what we know? Because God has revealed it, that we can know things. And like I said before also, what distinguishes our apologetic method and epistemology is that presuppositionists, at least in the Vantillian uh, Bonson school, is that we can have absolute certainty. We can have absolute knowledge and truth in what we claim to know. Not in everything, of course. We can't make the claim that we are absolute certain in everything we claim to know. But at least in some things, we can be certain because God has made it that way. Okay? He has made it that way for us humans to live in this world. Okay? And again, I explained some of that in part one and part two. But I want this to get into your heads is this. Okay. That people continue to harp on proof. Show me proof. Show me evidence. And they using use they want to use their reasoning process and their senses to evaluate evidence and proof. So again, we look at that and we say, that's all fine and dandy. But our question is, how do you account for your reasoning and your senses and proof and evidence and facts to begin with? What are the underlying preconditions that make those things possible? And our answer is God. (laughs) See? Now, whether the unbeliever accepts our worldview or not is irrelevant. Okay? It's irrelevant to the truth of the matter. They can't refute it. They can deny it. They can laugh and scoff at it. But when they critique or come against the transcendental argument for the existence of God, they have to rely on the transcendental argument of the existence of God and the Christian worldview in order to make any kind of rational argument against it. See? And that's why I see that as irrefutable. Okay? Because right away, they oh, the... the Transcendental argument for this is God. The transcendental argument is weak and it doesn't prove. And see, again, you're talking about proving and weak. Okay. According to what authority? What is your ultimate authority and standard for the knowledge claim that you're making against the transcendental argument in the first place? And and if your ultimate authority and standard is not God's word and what he has revealed, then you're not refuting time. You're actually making our case for us because you continue to harp on proof. Something's weak and and doesn't prove this and not convincing and persuasive. Again, you're not giving me a, a rational consistent justification 
for what makes something true, not true, weak or strong, persuasive or not persuasive. You got to deal with those facts first, the philosophy of facts before we can even get into facts. And that's the thing. Only the Christian worldview can account for and justify consistently and rationally the philosophy of facts. We can tell you how knowledge is possible. Okay. Not only that God has created, but also how do we know these things? It's through God's revelation. See, God's revelation tells us God is the creator of all things. And it tells us that we can justify how we know that God is the creator of all things in his word. See, so it's, there's no way getting around the fact that God's revelation is the ultimate standard, the ultimate authority in epistemology and in apologetics. There's no way around it. Because again, if you reject this epistemology, if you reject how we know what we know via God's revelation, and you can, and people reject all the time, but they do so to their own epistemic peril. Okay, they do so to their own absurdity. So, yeah, you can reject it if you want, but guess what? Your, your worldview then is going to lead to absurdity. It's going to lead to the ultimate of absurdities, skepticism. Okay? Pure skepticism. So, again, that, as Dr. Jason Lau likes to call it too, that's the nuclear argument, that bomb against all unbelieving worldviews, all non-biblical revelatory epistemologies. Okay. Only the revelation of God can account for consistently the preconditions of intelligibility that makes reality in this world possible to know. That includes knowledge, truth, Okay? And the laws of logic, the preconditions of intelligibility that make these things possible. Okay? So, the preconditions of intelligibility is, of course, we use those things on earth temporally or proximately. Of course, we start with our reasoning. We start with our senses, we already are understanding that these things are reliable. Okay? Sure. We have to start with our senses, with our reasoning, okay? With the preconditions of intelligibility as our basic assumptions, basic presuppositions that we as humans wake up to Every day. That is what we call our proximate, our temporal, local starting point. But our ultimate justification for these preconditions of intelligibility is the ultimate precondition. And that is God. God is the ultimate authority and standard and precondition for the local temporal preconditions. And that's where people get confused. Because they ask me, well, Rick, don't we have to read the Bible to understand it? Don't we got to use our reasoning process to, to understand scripture and things like that? Well, of course. And no one has said otherwise. But that's not the issue. The issue is, how do you know that that is the case? See? You can't just say, yeah, I just start with uh, my, the reliability of my senses of reasoning. And I have to because I'm human and nothing will make sense without them. And yeah, 
I agree with you 100%. But how do you know that? Well, I don't have to. They'll say, I don't have to. Uh, I don't have to know that. I, I don't have to account for those things. Oh, so it's okay then to be arbitrary. That's what you're telling me. You're okay with arbitrary, fallacious, vicious circularity. No, 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 no. That's not what I'm, yeah, actually, that is what you're saying. <laughs> you can deny that's not what you're saying. But when you tell me that I just start locally with my preconditions of intelligibility and you leave it at that, that doesn't solve the problem. That doesn't give me a consistent, rational justification for your worldview. See, And again, you can reject mine. You can reject the fact that God accounts for it. Okay? But you, and you do so to your own absurdity. Okay? And we can demonstrate that through the impossibility of the contrary. Not just the impossibility of contradiction, like some would suggest. There are Clarkians out there who would say, well, it's not the impossibility of the contrary, it's the impossibility of the contradiction. No, that, that shows me, that tells me that they're not understanding what we're saying. We don't just look to a worldview and say, oh, it contradicts itself, therefore it's false and Christianity wins. No. <laughs> that just tells me that their view is absurd and contrad contradictory. But what makes it false? And what makes Christianity true? It's the impossibility of the contrary. The contrary to what? Contrary to what God has said in his word. If you're a Christian, you already believe that. You, you already believe. You can reject these terms and ideas. But if you're, if you're going to stand on your Christian worldview, you already know that God is the only true God and what he said is true and he said there is no other gods and he said there is no knowledge without him you see so you already believe the impossibility of the contrary and how do we prove that that all other worldviews are absurd and false by the impossibility of the contrary and self-defeating and refuting self-refuting it's because they cannot account for the preconditions of intelligibility. That's the point. Not just a contradiction in their view. That's great to point out. But what you're ultimately pointing out is their epistemology. How do you know anything at all to even have contradictions in your worldview? That's, that, that's the issue. And any worldview... That's contrary to the Bible, to God's revelation, is false. Well, that's not persuasive to the atheist, Ricky. Okay. Like I said before, there is a difference between something being persuasive and something actually being proof. Okay, I got into that. You can show proof all day. You won't persuade the person because of their underlying preconditions and commitments to their worldview. Okay, their unbelieving worldview is not going to allow them to see the persuasiveness of any proof for God because they're totally depraved. Okay, they're dead spiritually by nature, children of wrath. Bible said they can't even know anything spiritually true because they're spiritually dead. Okay, they're unregenerate. And so, of course, one must have faith to understand these things. That doesn't mean now that just because we have to have faith in order to understand, that doesn't mean that it's still isn't objectively true. Okay, things can be objectively true and be rejected. 
because again of people's commitments to their presuppositions in the worldview. Okay. So I see it, we see it as the transcendental argument being not only a subjective proof because of the inner testimony of the Holy Spirit who gives us confidence and the assurance that it's true, but also that it's objectively true. Since without it, without God, you can't prove anything. Okay? And that's demonstrated again by the impossibility of the contrary. That is also objective. Matter of fact, I've had some atheists in a group called Defending Presuppositionalism. Um, let me see, one or two, like two or three atheists, and I've already screenshotted everything, I have proof that they say, well, if I'm going to accept your worldview, the way you present it, okay, this is them telling, talking to me, if you're going to present your Christian worldview that way, then it's irrefutable. But then they turn around and say, well, but then that's not fair. <laughs> it's not fair because it's irrefutable the way I'm saying it. And I try to explain to them, well, you have to accept my Christian worldview because that's my worldview. Now, go ahead and critique what I actually believe. What the Bible actually says, not your own opinion or what you think my worldview leads to, but my actual worldview, not hypotheticals and things like that, but what you actually, what we actually believe. And guess what? A few of them already said, man, it's irrefutable. But guess what they also say? But that doesn't prove anything to me. See? Even though objectively speaking, it's irrefutable, they still reject it. Why? Because they're unregenerate. Okay? They're unregenerate. If they reject the creation of the world as proof of the majesty and holiness of God's existence, they're not going to accept any other evidence. So, Ricky, why are we trying to persuade? No, we're not trying to persuade them. The role of apologetics, as I've said before, is to shut mouths. The role of apologetics is to defend Christianity and both a offense defense strategy against all the wisdom of the world, all unbelieving worldviews. We show them. Or we declare the gospel, the majesty of God and his word. Okay. And we call them to repent and let them know you already know that God exists. You don't need more evidence. And let me show you how absurd your worldview because you reject this, this God. That's what we're doing. Okay. Okay. We're destroying arguments. We're destroying worldviews that come against the knowledge of God. We're destroying worldviews that are contrary to God's word. That is the impossibility of the contrary. Only the God of Scripture can account for reality, for the world we live in. Okay? And it's consistent, it's rational. And it justifies the preconditions of intelligibility. Now, I want to get in the next episode, I want to get more into the atheist objections to tag, you know, how talk a little bit more about them claiming, well, I'm just going to uh, use the preconditions of intelligibility and logic as a basic axiom. It's my axiom. That's what they like to call it. Okay, the axiom, because axioms, by definition, are unprovable. So they'll just throw that at you. Oh, it's my axiom. I don't have to prove it. Okay. <laughs> All right. Or oh, they'll confuse presuppositions with axioms. Okay. Presuppositions we can account for and justify. Axioms, by definition, 
You cannot. That's why I don't use that term anymore. I used to be a Clarkian, but I don't use those words because my underlying presupposition that God exists and without him you can't prove anything can be demonstrated to be true by the impossibility of the contrary. See? So I have basic presuppositions that I come to the table with, but I can also justify them rationally and consistently. Atheism cannot. All other unbelieving worldviews cannot do that and renders them absurd, illogical, and foolish. That, my dear brothers and sisters, is the power of God's word.